Good evening, this is John Milburn for Prop 13001, Property Development, and this week we're dealing with the issue of development finance. Um, of course, we have the first uh, assessment, not too far away, in week eight. It's due, we've got one week uh, coming up soon of uh, holidays, and next Monday we have Easter Monday, so I suspect that um, it will be uh, not popular for me to record a session on Easter Monday, so we might have a catch-up session, a double session as it were, the week um, after the holidays. So next week is week five, we won't have a session on Easter Monday. Then we have the holiday week, so on week six we'll be dealing with, um, if you like, a tutorial session dealing with both uh, week five and week six content. But um, what I do uh, propose to do is supplement the study notes with, a, if you like, a f formal two-camera lecture. And uh, I have completed that for week four. I'll upload that probably this evening or tomorrow, as, long, as well as this uh, session, this tutorial session. And uh, I will upload formal lectures for each of the weeks. In terms of the study guides, I think I'm up to week nine that I've uploaded and uh, I'm well advanced in um, completing 10, 11, and 12. All right, so firstly, Ellen, I understand you might have a question about the assessment. Um, yep, so I've just, I've kind of started my assessment and I was wondering with the um, process, how we're doing the step-by-step -step our um, toolkit, with, for example, finance, um, is it a matter of we actually contact a bank and ask them their procedure of, getting the finance, their interest rate, what they require from us, etc. like that sort of in-depthness. I love it when people do that. And to be honest, without actually having said it, that's part of my, if you like, my MO with this type of assessment. Um, I'll just, in, to answer your question, yes, that would be great, but you don't have to. And I'll just explain some of the rationale I have behind these um, type of assessments. I do use toolkits a lot in um, different subjects. The idea is to make this practical for you. So I don't really want you just to go through the course, go through the motions, um, you know, memorize some material or just re reproduce some material by way of summary from the notes. I want you to walk away from the unit thinking, okay, I've actually got something now that I can use in practice. So the toolkit is something for you. Um, I'll assess it and I'll look at it, but it's when you're preparing it, think about what do I actually want to take away from this unit? What do I want if I am going to be a property developer or I'm working as part of a team for property development? You know, what are the important websites? Who are the contacts that I might make? Which bank would I deal with? So if you take this toolkit to its um, the extension I'd really love to see, you would actually make contact with banks You'd make contact with property developers, quantity surveyors. I mean, I know you could spend an awful lot of work and I'm not saying you have to, but the more realistic you make it, to answer your question, uh, Ellen, from my perspective, the better. But hopefully it's not, don't waste your time. Make it so that you're actually achieving something that's workable and useful for you. Does that answer your question, Ellen? Uh, yes, it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, for those of you that might be viewing this recording session saying, look, I haven't got enough time to be dealing with individuals actually in the industry and I don't really want to do property development as an industry or work in property development. I'm just doing this unit so I can get the pass. Then that's okay. Um, you can work based on material that you find in the text in the study guide in the um, lectures or perhaps through websites and not actually talk to people. But I would hope that you might consider making it as realistic as possible. So thanks, Alan. Any other questions? You can either ask through unmuting or using the chat facility. All right, so I'm aware that tonight you haven't had the advantage of listening to my two camera lecture, if I can use that term. Um, if you found this week tough, uh, I, I'm not necessarily surprised. I think that the hardest weeks in this unit are weeks three and four. Um, I think it will get easier. So if you're starting to feel this is all too much, then don't worry too much. The other thing is, um, if you've read my study guide, I'm really not happy about the way I provided a guide to better understanding example 4.2.
So I am going to replace that tonight. Um, some of the calculations just don't work in the way that I set it out. Did anyone pick up on that? Does anyone actually gone that far and looked at the detail? If you haven't, that's probably good because I can replace it. But I'll just give you that word of warning that it is going to be replaced. And um, uh, you've got to make sure that you re-download it if you've already done that. So has anyone worked through examples 4.1 and 4.2 in the context of forward funding proposals within an institution? It's okay to say no. All right, I'll take that as a no. Um, so just be aware that I will change that guide to example 4.2. <clears throat> so if you've already downloaded the um, lecture notes, the study guide, please um, go back and redo that. And I do apologise. And I'll send an email to everyone with the uh, revised version. It's only The only change will be the box on page 7, which is headed Guide to Better Understanding Example 4.2. I've made some changes there. All right, so does anyone, uh, does anyone want to tell me, let's see we've got a few more than usual. Does anyone want to tell me anything about their experiences in obtaining finance generally or obtaining finance for property development or maybe some ideas of how they would go about obtaining finance? Would you deal with a bank? Would you deal with a, a real estate investment trust? Would you try to work with a superannuation fund in a, some sort of forward funding arrangement? Would you look at a joint venture arrangement with a landowner and try and fund the property development that way? Anyone got any thoughts? Um, I do. Yeah. Um, with my assignment, what I decided to do is I actually contacted a bank and asked them what they necessarily need, like told them the scenario and what I was doing as a uni student and just said, what is your bank's process for obtaining finance for this sort of project? So they just gave me like a dot point list of what I needed, what their interest rates were, the the term of the loan, if like depending on what the finance I needed, how much they would generally loan and that sort of thing and what I needed to provide them as a, uh, just a sole person or as a uh, business slash company. Excellent. Oh, that's great. Did you find that experience rewarding, Ellen? Did you find it interesting? I did, but um, I, I really didn't know what, like, with the... Um, because we've got some capital behind us in the scenario. It's like, well, I really didn't know how much capital I had. So I just said, well, what can I borrow with this scenario? And they're like, about 60 to 70% is generally what the banks will let you borrow for um, a project like this one. So I'm going to try and work out my capital, what I've got behind me as such from there. But yeah, it was really good. Like, and it was interesting from a, like when you go for personal finance compared to business finance, how they um, work out the interest rates, variable or fixed and that sort of thing. So it was a good little conversation. That's good. Oh, that's excellent. I'm really pleased that you've, you've taken time and trouble to do that. And um, look, to be honest, it's a while since I wrote the scenario. I don't know if I put in a figure for the acquisition of the land. Did I put in an actual figure to say this is the contract price? Or did I leave it open-ended? Either way, you can approach it this way. You can say, all right, well, we've got an idea. I've spoken to some quantity surveyors. I, I've done some comparative research. I've um, uh, got an idea of how much it costs to construct the uh, project, just in rough terms. Um, I know what my profit margin is, and you can use your discounted flash, uh, cash flow models that we talked about in week three to come up with a profit figure. And um, if you follow what they, the authors did in the text, they, they were sort of work on about 20%. I think that's a bit low. But, you know, you might say, well, 20% is the profit margin. Therefore, if I take all of that into account, um, I can afford to spend this much on the land for development. So that's a reverse way of looking at it. Uh, you not, you're nominating the price at which you're prepared to buy it rather than necessarily considering what the seller is asking. So that's a different way. But that's good, Ellen. Thank you. All right. So um, when you're dealing with banks, mainstream lenders, what you'll probably find is that it's different, as Ellen, I think, has found, in the sense that the loan-to-value ratios that the financiers will discuss with you are considerably lower 
than would be the case if it's residential. So if you're a residential buyer for an owner-occupier home, you might find that the um, bank require you to provide 20% deposit. If you have less than 20%, they might ask for mortgage insurance. But as a property developer, looking to fund both the acquisition of the land and the development costs, you may find that you need to put in more like 40% of the overall cost. So that makes it harder to get into the market. So that's an interesting way to look at it as well. Now, has anyone got some ideas on, on how you might factor in contingencies and risk? Let's say, for example, some sort of market downturn in relation to real estate. How are you going to deal with that in your toolkit? Any thoughts? Yes, Anna? Um, sorry, I don't want to take over. <laughs> um, so yeah. I've started looking into um, the local council in my area where I was going to put the um, said development and looked at what's going around, like, like what's going on in the community. So what the council are doing in regards to upgrading buildings, building new buildings, um, other developments that are happening around the community, for example, um, there's a lot of units and that going up um, and that sort of thing. And also what's the future um, developments for the council and their environmental sort of stuff that they're wanting to implement in the community. And so I've just, I've been on the website. I haven't contacted them, contacted them yet as such, but that's kind of the approach that I've taken. Excellent. That's great. Um, you know, and uh, the other thing that you can do is uh, just sort of ask around, maybe at the planning department of your local council, say how many how many sort of um, proposals are in the pipes pipeline in relation to uh, mixed use um, and residential type developments. They might say, oh, we really need that sort of stuff, in which case you can factor that in as um, likely to be advantage advantageous to your development, otherwise uh, could be the other way. So thanks, Ellen. Does anyone, um, has anyone done any reading about Australian real estate investment trusts? A bit like a company, but set up as an investment vehicle for individuals primarily, so that they can achieve some result as if they were a property developer. So a strategy that you might uh, consider is working in conjunction with an Australian um, real estate investment trust to assist in financing the um, acquisition and development of the property. So there might be some advantages to you as a property developer. You might decide that that's the way that you wish to approach this and uh, try and identify the advantages or disadvantages. So in other words, um, I'm going to give you plenty of license in this assessment. If you genuinely feel that um, going alone, as it were, is not the best way to go, then feel free to think about alternate arrangements or even discuss those alternative arrangements. But what I don't really want in any assessment work is just a dot point. You know, you could do this or you could do that or you could do that. Um, that's pretty easy. I, I want you to be a bit more insightful on that. All right. Um, when it comes to property finance and financiers, I, I don't know if Ellen, you've struck this or not, but when you were dealing with the bank, but I would think that you need to have a properly prepared written presentation, something that is um, very professional in terms of its look and its content and deal with some issues that the financier will want to know about. So what sort of things do you think a financier would be interested to know about your proposal as a property developer? And what do you think they'd like to see presented to them to consider the application. Any thoughts? On the chat facility, right, Laura says cash flows. I totally agree with that. Cash flows. Um, and Laura, are you talking about discounted um, cash flows, discount um, over a period of time? <clears throat> yes, okay. Ellen says, the bank will want to know profit margins and you'll need to discuss issues to do with cost and time. Um, so it really seems to me inescapable 
that in order to prepare your toolkit, you need to have some sort of spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet. When it comes to the unit week of market research, some other interesting alternatives to just a, a straightforward Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, by the way, or a Google Excel spreadsheet. Um, but I think you'll need to have some sort of spreadsheet. So yes, I agree with that. Financiers will want to know something about you too, won't they? I want to know who they're dealing with. So if you've got a track record as a property developer, that's great. Begs the question, what happens if you don't have a background in property development? What if this, what if this is your first one? What do you think they'd like to know, the financiers would like to know as part of your application for finance? Personal finances, absolutely, yes. Your equity, how much you can put into this, your own profit and loss, as it were. I guess they wanna know whether you have some source of other income available to assist in funding the loan. They might wanna know what expertise you have. I guess you could say that you're um, a student of Prop 13001 Property Development at Central Queensland University. That would add some credibility to your application, better than someone who has no um, formal uh, training in the discipline. So as you're going through your proposal and thinking about your finance application, I would urge you to think about it from the perspective of the financier and try to provide them with something that you think they need to, to know. I'm not talking about embellishing your application or outright, outright lying in the application. That's not my intent at all, but really to provide an answer to the questions that they're likely to ask and present the answer before they've even asked the question. You'll add credibility and kudos to your application. So I think you've got to have a written proposal. In your toolkit, you can always annex a written proposal to the, um, to the paper, uh, or you can build it in as, as a, some sort of chapter, if you like, some sort of template. But I think you need to have some sort of written proposal for the financier. Um, and you'll need to think about what type of finance you want, whether you want short-term, long-term, or mezzanine finance. Has anyone read the difference between those three types of finance applications, which is based, based on time, short-term, mezzanine, and long-term? Or well, we haven't quite done our reading yet for the week. All right, so um, what you'll see is that banks primarily we'll be talking to you as a property developer in what we would call short-term finance. And short-term finance is relative. I'm not saying that it's, you know, uh, two weeks or a month or six months. Short-term might be three years or four years, but short-term is basically to get you into the property that you're developing and through the process of constructing on that property so that it's ready for sale. So if you think of this uh, project as having a three-year duration, then short-term finance means three years. <clears throat> but short-term finance might be limited to uh, an amount. Your, your personal equity may be insufficient to allow you to deal with the fund, one financier throughout the project, in which case you may need to bring in mezzanine financiers. They're gonna charge you more, and they're not looking at first mortgage security, not quite bridging loan, but it's a little bit like that. And uh, the mezzanine financiers may actually want some sort of profit share. So there might be, uh, it may not be as standard um, as it is with uh, short-term funding when you're dealing with a uh, mezzanine financier. Now, long-term financiers, you're probably back with mainstream financiers again, but what you're looking to do is have enough funding to enable you to not only develop and complete the development but then hold it. So uh, it may be that you need funding to keep um, putting money into the project even after it's finished, but while you're marketing for tenants, um, you know, you've got empty shops or empty um, premises, things of that nature. So long-term funding is really more the traditional, say 30 year funding, where you are not only the developer, but you also become the investor. Um, in the notes, I think I've made some comments about commercial leases and what you need to consider for commercial leases, you know, long-term, uh, try and get a good lease rate, 
that has a bearing on the rate of return, uh, which has a, ba a bearing on the capitalization rate. So as you come across some of these terms, probably a good idea to create a little dictionary for yourself or have access to that um, material. All right, any questions or comments? I'm doing a lot of talking. I'm trying not to. Yes, um, I have a question. Um, with the finance, I find, well, from what I've seen, a lot of developers um, advertise what they're putting on the land and you buy off the plan. So how does that, or how would you work that into your finance? Because a lot of, like, that would probably be your smartest thing to do to get some of your cash or to get continuous cash flow to either return to the bank or to continue on with the project. So how does that kind of fit in with the process of, like, do you get your finance first and then advertise to buy off the plan to get more of that cash flow to return to the bank, if that makes sense? Absolutely, or yes. Um, look, if, you're, if your plan is to um, engage in off the plan sales, I think that's an excellent strategy because it provides you with some, I suppose, guarantee that the project is viable and it will help secure your finance. Um, and it may mean that you can continue with short-term finance with mainstream financiers rather than having to resort to mezzanine finance um, to, in order to get the project completed. So off the plan contracts is an excellent way to proceed as a property developer, but you do need to be aware of the Land Sales Act and the um, Body Corporate and Community Title Act uh, in that regard. But as a strategy, yes, very good. So good point, Ellen. I think that's a good, good way to go. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. Okay, good, thank you. And um, uh, while the authors of your text really haven't mentioned lawyers very much, um, in my experience, I, I'm a barrister now, but I was a solicitor for many years, when acting for property developers, um, uh, we would be involved right at the start. Um, so we're involved in drafting the off the plan contracts, the leases, um, the contracts with uh, parties that are contractors or other uh, employees, perhaps, things of that nature. So I think um, having lawyers involved at an early stage is a good idea for those sorts of things as well. Um, sometimes if you're doing an off the plan project, you may have to be prepared to sell some of the first units cheaply in order to, as it were, get the ball rolling. Which means that if you're looking to buy property, conversely, um, sometimes purchasing off the plan early, getting in early, may mean that you get a better deal. You're getting the price not only based on today's price, where you have to pay two or three years down the track when the building is built, but also if you're getting in at a stage where the developer needs to show a pre-commitment of say 30% of the building before they will get funding, they're likely to discount the price in order to get that 30% pre-sale. Once they've got their 30% and they've got their funding, then the developer can afford to lift the prices back to more a market price rather than at a discounted price. So, so off the plan, Acquisitions can be risky for the developer, um, also risky for the buyer, but as a buyer, you can get a, quite often get a good deal. So I think that's a good way to go. Um, now, I think probably the hardest part of week four relates to the forward funding uh, scenarios with an institution. I mentioned the guides that I've prepared to better understanding those examples. I think the authors, um, even though the book is good, I think the authors could have done a better job in explaining how you work through examples 4.1 and 4.2. So if you um, are struggling with that, have a look at my guide um, and listen to the um, lecture that I've completed but yet uploaded, and hopefully that will help you at least understand the maths behind the um, examples. Okay. So, are there any questions, any comments, anything you want to talk about from the first three weeks as well as this week? Are there areas of the reading from week four that you want me to expand upon? Do we all understand commercial leases? We've got some idea of how that links to investment returns. 
etc. I mentioned um, mortgage security, another area for the lawyers to get involved. So banks um, will invariably ask for first mortgage security. If you're a company, they'll ask for a personal guarantee. Remember, a mortgage is both a security document and a contract. So it'll have as a contract, it'll have terms and conditions. And even if that security is released, the contract elements remain. And what that means is that if you're going into a property development, be aware of this risk, that it, you risk more than just the property development if things go bad. So you might lose the land, you might lose the equity that you put into it, and most people would say, well, that's it, um, that no more. But because there's a personal guarantee, because there's a personal covenant in the contract with the bank, the bank can then turn around and say, look, we've taken all of the security, we're still short, therefore you still owe us the money, and we can now attack your family home or your personal shareholding or whatever it might be. So there's the personal covenant that goes beyond the security element as well. Uh, John, I've, I've got a question. Uh, how would you diversify the risk of like being a de the developer? How would you know? What would you do? How would you diversify the risk? Yeah. Okay, that's a really good. That's a really good question, because risk is so much a part of this unit. Um, so, what would you do to diversify the risk? Well, I guess it depends on the scale of the developer. If you're brand new to the industry and you're just stretching to get into your very first development, which is a small development, then you may have to accept that there's not much you can do about it. And you might just have to bite the bullet and proceed and do the best you can, knowing that there's a risk that you can't diversify against. One thing you could consider doing, though, is um, setting up a, an appropriate structure with, say, your partner. So. Um, your partner may own the family home and any private assets that you have, but you as the property developer might be the sole director of a company, um, which is the development company. <clears throat> so uh, separating assets from risk between two people is always a good way to go. A bit hard if you don't have a partner because you've got no one to separate that with. Another way, of, if you're a bit bigger can developer, you, yes, Laura? Can you like open a trust account or something? If you yes. don't have anyone else to, you know, to take the properties instead of you? You could, you could open, you could try and establish some sort of company or trust yeah. which separates your assets in a different entity. So a company or a trust has a different entity to you, but banks tend to be on top of that and, um, uh, they're very they're very quick to take whatever equity they can, um, but no, that's a good strategy. And you might put that in your toolkit. You might say, well, I would. The way I'm going to do it is I'm not going to buy this or develop it in my own name, and risk my own personal assets. I'm going to try and separate things. So that's a good strategy. If you get a bit bigger, you could look at different types of developments in different um, areas, geographical areas, and different types of developments. But sometimes it's better if you stay with what you, you know. And if you're developing commercial properties, then, you know, why would you then, if you're developing office space and that's what you know and that's what you're good at, I suppose it's a good argument to say, well, why would you build an abattoir just for the sake of diversification when you should keep doing what you do and you know it well? Same with, say, construction of houses. So it's a good question. I'm sorry I'm not giving a very... Good answer though, Laura, Laura, because I'm not sure there is necessarily a good answer. It's no, that's uh, right. Thank you. Thank you. But did that answer your question to a degree? Yeah, yeah. I was just a bit, you know, because as you know, like, yeah, when you're an investor, you can, you know, diversify like the risk and everything. But then I thought, look, as a developer, it would be a bit harder. But yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, some of the things we've talked about essentially relate to diversification. So if you're a developer and you're and you're a bit nervy on it, you can bring in a partner or a joint venture arrangement. Uh, you know, you can be very proactive and say, and knock on the, the door of the um, pineapple farmer who has a, um, a pineapple farm on the edge of um, um, the development um, 
and say, well, look, if we can get the infrastructure, if we can work with the council to get the infrastructure to come up to the edge of your farm, then I can develop your farm if you're prepared to work with me in a joint venture arrangement. So that might be sharing the risk by going in with somebody else. It's another option. Yeah. All right, so good question. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? All right, you've been very patient with me. So just to recap, next week, Easter Monday, there'll be no live session. I'll let people know. That is actually week five. So what we're going to do is we'll have our, if you like, our tutorial session, tonight's session, for week five and merge it in with week six. And that won't be the following Monday because the following Monday is the uni break. So it will be two weeks after Easter Monday. We'll deal with week five and week six. I hope that makes sense. Next thing is um, the lecture for this week, week four, I will upload shortly. Then I am making a change to my guide to better understanding example 4.2. So be aware of that for your study guide. It will need to be amended if you've already printed it or downloaded it onto your computer. Uh, make sure that you keep at your assessment. Uh, don't leave it to the last minute. This sort of thing needs a bit of lead time. So you should be doing that. And I would encourage you to work through the weekly problems. So as you're doing your reading, make sure you have the weekly problems there and try to provide an answer. Look, ideally you would upload your answer onto Moodle um, so that we, others can see it and we can discuss it, but at least make sure that you answer each question uh, each week for your own learning um, and keep it ready. It might help for the examination. Who knows, down the track. All right, are there any questions? Have I missed anything that I need to consider? All good? All right. Well, I'll end the session then tonight and we will see you not next week, not the week after, but I guess in three weeks from now. Any final questions before we go? Comments? All good? Okay. Thank you. Yes, Laura? No, all good. <laughs> all good? Okay. All right. Well, I'll end now and we'll see you all later. Bye then. Thank you. Bye.